What causes mental illness? Hello and welcome, Anthony Samaroff, international therapist and life coach. Now, this might be striking as a highly controversial and subjective live feed. Thank you for joining me. It is, let's say, not to be a substitute for consulting your physician if you are suffering from this. It is not intended as medical advice. Here is my account through my experience and research of what causes mental illness. And it is going to fly in the face of a lot of accounts which I hold you responsible for comparing my account to uh, I, uh, and drawing your own conclusions from in the fact that I do not accept the proposition that mental illness is caused by a so-called chemical imbalance in the brain. I will put my cards on the table and say, I do not believe that. You can draw your own conclusions. I would say, on the contrary, the chemical imbalance in the brain is caused by the mental illness. You can listen to my account and draw your own conclusion. Now, my account is this. This organism that we are, that you are, that I am, is geared mostly towards the survival of the organism. Human life begins when the physiological needs are met. Animal life ends when the physiological needs are met. So a cat or a tiger or any animal you can think of, maybe some of the higher primates do not fall in this category, but basically if they've got a full belly, they're happy, they're okay, they're, they're happy to take a nap, their life is complete. Everything that we consider a higher faculty for a human being begins when we've got a full belly, shelter, and so forth. That's when science begins. That's when art begins. That's when fulfilling relationship begins. That's when self-reflection begins, and so forth. So this organism is on the bottom level an animal, but we have higher faculties built on top of that. But fundamentally, this organism, um, quite apart from what your conscious mind might think, is primarily focused on survival. When human beings are unique in that they have a unprecedented power to change their environment. However, when you're a child, you do not have the power to change your environment. You do not. Humans are expert at adapting to environment. That's why we are on every single continent on the planet. We can adapt ourselves to our environment. And when you're growing up, you have no control over the environment that you grew up in. Therefore, you revert to the animal, the most primitive part of the brain back here, the medulla oblongata, and you adapt yourself to the environment. So if you are in an environment where there is a lot of anxiety, a lot of tension and so forth, you will adapt to that environment and adopt a strategy which will help you as an organism survive that environment which you do not have the power to change. When you grow up, all your adaptations do not necessarily turn themselves off. That will take a conscious effort on your part. Now, I'm talking a lot of philosophy here, so I should probably get down to some examples. So as an adult, if you're an assertive person, that's very much going to help you get ahead in life. You'll get better jobs. You'll be able to make your needs known in relationships, and you will attract the kinds of relationships to you which will meet your needs. If you're not very assertive, if you're a people pleaser, you will often find that people walk all over you and so forth. Now that might not seem very adaptive as an adult environment. You never know if you're going to be called cheeky or rude or fresh or even be punished for being assertive and making known your needs. So you learn to um, can it and then later on you're told that you have low self-esteem because the strategies that your brain, not just you, but your brain, your physiology adopted, um, do not turn themselves off. Um, 
You might have found that when you were young, as soon as you were expressing excitement or your energy got high, you were punished or you were put down or you were told not to get so excited or you were, you, you, your happiness triggered the people around you. So you learned to keep, your physiology learned to keep your mood low in order to avoid punishment or negative consequences for being happy. Your whole physiology is a soup all your emotions are based on physiological reactions that are cooked up inside you. So your brain learned to cook up some negative emotions to avoid attention, to avoid negative attention, to avoid punishment. If you were surrounded by anxious people growing up, it's very likely that if you were not anxious mirroring their emotions, they would think that you were not taking it seriously. And in order to avoid that punishment, as a child, you don't have the communication skills or techniques to be a counsellor for your, for the adults around you and help them become less anxious. So in order to merge in and become just like everyone else around you, your brain cooked up the emotions of anxiety and got used to producing anxiety. And then you get told when you're growing up that you've got an anxiety disorder, which is a consequence of a chemical imbalance in the brain. Now, I would suggest that your anxiety is not caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain, but the chemical imbalance in the brain is caused by your anxiety. Uh, you might become highly sensitive because your best defense against criticism was to go into a rage. And your brain learned to cook up the emotions of fight. You've all heard of the fight or flight response, actually the fight, flight or freeze response, you found that the most adaptive response to avoid punishment in your environment was to get um, highly emotional, strung up and deter attackers by becoming more vicious than them. Then when you grow up, you're told that you've got borderline personality disorder because as soon as anyone steps on your feet or pushes your buttons, you go into a rage. Is that because you've got a chemical imbalance in the brain? Is that because you're mentally ill? Or is that because an attack was to be the attacker, to instantly go into defensiveness and scare people off attacking you by becoming the attacker? This is down to your discretion to decide. I'm not saying that this is the final word on the matter. I'm just saying that this is a theory that you can take into your mind and into your heart and see if it matches your experience or if you believe in the prevalent view, which is that your mental illness is caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain. Now that I've talked about all of these things, I should just say a little bit about trauma and the physiology of tra trauma, and then we're going to get into some solutions. So uh, I've got a comment here from Simmer Eve. To be honest, I've thought exactly this for a long time. From where I can see it going, most people's childhoods are tragic. I found this useful. I'm just about to get into some solutions and things like that, but please pump the share button. Share this on your way, but I would also like to reach new people. So hit that share button and let other people know if you think this is useful. So the physiologic, the physiology of trauma. Robert Scare leading world expert on trauma, a traumatologist, believes that all pathologies are caused by trauma. All of them. You can make up your own mind. And he explains that what happens when the organism, the body, experiences a trauma, which he defines as any situation which you perceive as life-threatening, doesn't necessarily have to be life-threatening, but you perceive it as life-threatening, and you experience that in a state of helplessness. If you could run away, you'd run away. If you could fight, you'd fight, etc. If you experience helplessness and a perceived threat to your life, there's a good chance your brain will suffer a trauma. Now, what happens is the brain reacts to that trauma, but it doesn't unreact from that trauma. That will take a co an act of conscious volition. And the reason for that is because your brain doesn't care about your quality of life. It only cares that you have life. It only cares that you survive the trauma. So after the trauma has suffered, your brain goes, well, that's obviously a useful strategy that helped me survive the trauma. So therefore, that's a good strategy and I'm going to adopt that for the rest of my life, unless you make a change. So the, the, the 
this has been demonstrated in experiments. For example, they can give a rat a mini stroke and within a day's time, the blood vessel which they burst has regrown and physiologically there's nothing wrong with its brain, but maybe it's lost the function of its eyes or of its front limbs. Even though there's nothing physiologically wrong with those body parts, it just can't use them because the brain has reacted to the trauma and not unreacted. So how do we reverse that? That is the critical question. Well, you can look up trauma release exercises. They're extremely uh, effective. I've used them myself and I've taught them to some of my clients, although I'm not um, uh, trained to do that. I've just pointed them out and sent them in the, the direction of resources on that. Um, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy works for some people. I'm not a huge fan of it. I don't use it with my clients. I've not found that it's worked for me, but some people uh, claim that it works for them. Talking therapy in which you are subjected to the experience of some of the emotions from that trauma, which you've not fully integrated before, but you're allowed to do it in a controlled way that doesn't overwhelm you. You go through those emotions, you re-experience them with support, and after you've experienced them, some of that uh, effect can be released. That is very effective. And But I would just say a word on that. When you experience that, you should not allow the emotion to flood you so you get overwhelmed with it. Because if you do that, you can re-traumatize yourself. You're only meant to allow the emotions to arise in the measure which you can de deal with and at the pace you're meant to deal with it. Otherwise, it can be completely overwhelming and can actually be tra um, detrimental. Um, so you've probably heard of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. People come from back from a war or something like that and they're a complete changed person. They've got a fiery temper, which they didn't used to have and so forth. There's also something called complex PS PTSD, which is not necessarily caused by one traumatic event, but a series of small traumatic events over a large course of time, which really set the relays in your brain. They keep on reinforcing one another until you act a different way. And I think that pretty much everyone is suffering from PTSD. That's my personal opinion, is suffering from PTSD to a smaller or larger degree in the society we have, because this information is not that well known. EFT, I've heard, I've not used it personally, but I've heard it can be very effective for some people in uh, overcoming trauma. And of course, um, seeing a traumatologist, trauma therapy, therapy for grief. One thing that I suggest to everyone, whether you want to go for more professional help or not, is to journal three pages every day. Set, uh, start your practice. Every day, it doesn't matter when you do it, it doesn't matter if you do it in the morning or the evening, set some time aside, 15 minutes, to write three pages in your diary and write about all the experiences, what's going on in your head, what you're feeling, just to help you process that and integrate that and get you on top of yourself so that anything, so that you're getting rid of the accumulated storage of emotions and that means that anything you're dealing with, the past or what you're going through right now, you've discreetly uh, dealt with to some degree, which leaves your mind freer to deal with the present moment. Of course, if you want to see a professional, a therapist or a coach, I certainly recommend my services, but you don't need to book me. I think that most people could benefit from talking to someone and make sure you choose someone who comes highly recommended not through, not necessarily through the NHS or the official channels, although I'm sure there's good people working through those channels, but you know, what you get put with is essentially a roll of the dice. Choose someone who comes highly recommended uh, from people you know or someone that you know knows who can say, this person really helped me turn my life around and change my life. If you would like to see me, um, you can email me at anthony at beyourselfandloveit.com or you can send me a private message and you can send me a little email telling me what you're facing, what your symptoms are, what you think you'd like to be like and I will do a preliminary session with you 
and we can decide if we'd be a good match and I'd be able to help you or not. I would like to see people a lot happier than they are with a lot less um, involuntary emotions, anxiety, depression, um, and so forth, just coming out of nowhere. Why am I feeling depressed? Why am I feeling, why am I feeling anxious? Well, maybe your organism, your body, learned that that was the best way to deal with a situation that you didn't have much control over. And maybe you now, your brain needs to be retrained to learn to cook up a different chemical soup. And yeah, I definitely recommend you get along to an exercise class, do some yoga, uh, get into your body, stretch out all the tensions. If you've got tight hamstrings, if you've got tightness in your body, that is a good indication that your body has reacted to a trauma and is still storing those tensions and hasn't managed to release them yet. 10 or 15 stretch, minutes stretching every day would significantly, in my opinion, my highly subjective opinion, uh, reduce stress and symptoms of mental illness from most people. If you carry a lot of tension in your body, if you don't have flexibility in your body, that is a good indication that your body has reacted to a trauma and hasn't unreacted and you can stretch those out in the measure that you're able to. Um, if you've got severe symptoms, you might want to go into that cautiously. And to be honest, you might not be in the mood to do it. You might not want to do it because your brain thinks that you being the way you are has helped you survive so far and isn't so keen to make a big change in that direction. So, but just because you don't want to do something doesn't mean that isn't good for you. We all know we could eat better. We all know we could benefit from taking exercises. That doesn't mean we necessarily feel like doing it. So take a cautious approach, try things out. Don't give up too quickly. Don't give up because it still feels crap after a week or two. But don't go from doing nothing to doing shed loads all at once. Build it in, find a small practice that works for you. And when you've got that into a routine, you can always add something and add something. Please share this video if you think it'll be useful to others. I don't just want to speak to myself. And obviously, if you want to contact me and you want my help, I think that I could be of help to a lot of people. So put this video out and, and get in touch with me if you think I might be the right person. If you don't, get in touch with someone who you think might be. Uh, thank you very much for tuning into my live stream. And, you know, I don't mean to go on and on about this, but please share it because if it gets shared, I know I'm doing a good job and that encourages me to do more. If I'm always speaking to the same pair people, I don't know how much you dig this you know I know it's hard to put stuff like this on your wall because you think people might judge you but you know what you want to find out who the people who are going to judge you for sharing this stuff are and who are the people who are going to go really great post thank you for posting that up because they're the people you can be intimate with and have deep and meaningful conversations with you definitely want more of them in your life thank you again and until next live feed good night